Huey Lewis, thank you so much for stopping by USA Today. How you feeling? I feel good. I feel really good. We saw the show last night and it was really good. Again, I saw things in our show that I'm only now finding out. Really? Like what? Well, like little things. Now, you know, I watched from the mezzanine last night and you see all the upstage stuff better. You know, I know the show real well because I've seen it a bunch. So I don't focus on the lead characters so much as the, as the peripheral. And it's really interesting to see all the stuff that's, that's going on. I mean, like any good show, you see it, 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 it gets better for a while the more, more times you see it. Anyone recognize you in the theater? Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, a, a few photos involved. Yeah, right. There you go. It's interesting to hear you say that you're still finding out things or seeing things. Right. You've been living with this musical since, what, 2018? Yeah, but we've changed it a whole bunch since then. I mean, it's uh, we put it up in San Diego for six months and it did really. It was great, but we've done so much since then. It's it's really almost a different show. Obviously, you had to go through the Broadway shutdown as well with COVID in 2020. Right, right. Were there ever any thoughts of maybe this isn't going to happen and you were ready to give up on it or no? Only every day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, it's such a it's such a chore really a lot of things have to come together it's very collaborative you, you know as you know and, and the cast is, is so important COVID actually helped us because we had a lot of time to work on the writing and so on during that time and 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 kind of you know retool the play and it's a much better show now I know you were on Broadway in Chicago and I heard you tell the story about kind of one of your first experiences with Broadway going right. to see Mamma Mia when did it dawn on you, though, that your catalog could be a musical on Broadway? Well, you know, lots of people had already come to me and said, oh, you should do a musical. You should do it. And I said, well, hey, the proof is in the pudding. We need a script. You need a script. You need a story. Right. And then that usually scared them off. So uh, but John Abrams, our writer and Tyler Mitchell, our producer, uh, they came to me with this idea. And I said, sure, good luck. And they went away and came back with a very good first draft. Of course, that was like 20 drafts ago, but, uh, but that's, that got the ball rolling anyway. Yeah. These songs, figuratively speaking, are your children. How difficult is it to let John and others tweak them, use them in a different context, and then, of course, obviously see them performed on stage? That's uh, a very good question. And it's, um, you know, you want... The, the songs need to push the story forward, but you don't want to compromise the integrity of the song. So we changed it a little bit here and there in order to aim it in certain directions, each song, and, and wound the story through that. So it was a painstaking process and a lot of, you know, a lot of emotion and a lot of stuff. But uh, what we came out with, I think, is, is pretty good. Were there ever any points throughout the creative process where you really had to dig in your heels and say, we can't do that, we can't make this change, or I don't like this particular context? Yeah, many, but, but all, mostly little stuff, you know? It's so, such a complicated thing. You know, we, we did a, um, a, the, the documentary of We Are The World is just out, and Quincy Jones informed us in the very beginning, he said, he had the whole, all of us assembled, and he said, now look, this, this, we're going to make this record. It's like building a house. So we start with a foundation, then we put the frame up, then we put the roof, then we do all the finish work. That's how we're going to do it later. And so, and he's quite right. But if making a record is building a house, then putting a Broadway show up is building a whole city. <laughs> and so, you know, there was a, a thousand, a million different decisions, and all of which pushes everything, you know, it improves incrementally. How do you feel about the title of the musical being, of course, one of your songs, The Heart of Rock and Roll? And correct me if I'm wrong, this song was kind of born out of an argument, right? That even though you shout out New York in the beginning, it's not really about New York. No, no. It, it, was, it was originally inspired by Cleveland, believe it or not, because we had heard that Cleveland was a, the greatest rock and roll town in America. And I thought, how can that be? I'm from San Francisco, for God's sakes. You know, there's... So many been, and then we played a show, our first show in Cleveland, Huey Lewis and the News, I'm talking about, at the Agora, and the show was amazing. And, and, and on the on the bus ride out, it was like a, a smoky, hazy day, and you see the tough sideline, and there's that Cleveland shirt I'm wearing 
with it with a, a skyline that says Cleveland, you got to be tough. And I had this, and the show was so great. And I said, I remarked to the guys in the bus. I said, guys, you know what? The heart of rock and roll really is in Cleveland. And I said, hey, that's a good idea for a song. And they went, the heart of rock and roll is in Cleveland. And I said, yeah, oh, okay. So I, I kind of rewrote it, but that was the inspiration for it. Yeah. And the pushback from your bandmates was that, no, isn't the heart of rock and roll in San Francisco? Is no, no, the no? pushback just meant, you know, Cleveland. Uh, so oh, okay. I, I made it the heart of rock and roll is still beating. Right. But it's really about Cleveland. In New, York, New York's a great place and a lot of stuff to do. LA's a great place and a lot of stuff. But the heart of rock and roll is where you find it. And I think as a, as a title for our, our musical, it makes perfect sense because our show is about uh, the heart of rock and roll. It's about the power of love, if you will. Interesting premise, though. It's a three-day business conference for packing supplies. Uh, how did that premise come about, and were there other premises maybe on the table 20 drafts ago? Well, there were, but, uh, but it, this has been there for a long time. John Abrams, our writer, he gets full credit for that. I, had, I never would have thought of a cardboard company, but it's great because he goes from a rock star to a box star. <laughs> Another one I'm sure you've been able to workshop a little bit. That oh, yeah. Time. yeah. <laughs> um, and then as far as like being back in New York City, uh, so many different memories on and off Broadway. What comes to mind when you come back to the city? I just love the energy of this city. It's, it's funny because, you know, I mean, things are tough everywhere in the world. And when you go to California, it seems like in L.A., it, it seems like people are just kind of, the resign, they're kind of, I don't know, they're kind of down. And But in, in New York, no matter the situation, people are just up. There's just tons of energy here. And I, I just love this town. When you realized that your musical was going to be on Broadway at the same time as the Back to the Future musical was going to be on Broadway, what were your thoughts? Oh, it's, it's amazing, right? We have, In fact, we have two tunes that they shared back in time and, and Power Love. Uh, yeah, amazing. And, and actually, interestingly, Back to the Future, Power Love is their finale. And Power Love is also our finale in our show. And their show is like 10 minutes longer than ours. But if we start late and they start on time, there's a strong possibility and even a probability that Power of Love is playing at the exact same time in two theaters. <laughs> pretty, pretty amazing. I mean... As you just said, it's a, it's a tough time. That's pretty cool. I mean, we could use the love, right? That's right. I mean, uh, we always say, what we like to say about our show is that it won't change your life, but it will change your evening. Right. <laughs> I saw Michael J. Fox was in town at a Rangers game. Right. Has he come to see your musical yet? He has not yet. He just had surgery not too long ago, but we did an interview together, and um, uh, he's going to come to the show. He's been very supportive. He's such a great guy, you know, and people don't realize how funny he is. I mean, he is very funny and, and just warm and genuine. Great, great guy. Have you, um, especially, you know, you've obviously dealt with an issue in 2013 where your hearing is, you know, begin to look, you can't yeah. perform live anymore. Um, have you talked with him at all about that? Because he's been so open with his struggles and overcoming them. Yeah, we have. And, and, and that in itself is a chore because, you know, he's, he speaks a little funny now with his affliction, and I can't hear. So we're really a, a pair. We have to be about this close to one another to be able to understand. What, what's the, the big message that you've gotten from him? Oh, just support. Just lots of support. He, and he, he can't wait to see the show. I got a message that he's heard such great things about it that he can't wait to see it. As far as your show, The Heart of Rock and Roll, what's your favorite moment in the show? Well, well there are several uh, but um, uh, I'm going to say Stuck With You and Give Me The Keys are my two favorite moments, but only a little bit because there's lots of, lots of other stuff that's great. But the choreography is fabulous, I think, and, and it's funny. Our show is funny, and, um, you know, funny's not easy. Uh, funny's hard. Uh, funny has to be smart to be funny, and uh, sometimes I, I think it, it's harder than dark, I want to talk about another song of yours, Hip to be Square. Okay. You had, singing backup on it, Joe Montana, Ronnie Lott, Dwight Clark, Ricky Ellison. I'm thinking if that happened in 2024, even if you got 
Brock Purdy and Christian McCaffrey and, you know, Ayuk maybe, let's just say, or, or at, if you did the equivalent, because at the time, those guys are the faces of the NFL. So if you got, in this day and age, a Patrick Mahomes, a Travis Kelsey, I can't imagine, like, what the red tape would be to get them to record a commercially released song. What was that like for you with those guys back when you recorded that one? Well, it, it was real sort of organic. You know, we met at a, an awards show in San Francisco, of, of, and they were presenting award, and we won the award. And they uh, professed themselves fans. And I said, well, you know, it's mutual. And, and he says, look, how about, and Joe is a joke, said, how about letting us sing on one of your songs, and we'll give you a couple snaps. And I said, you're on. And so uh, with hip to be square we had the idea of bringing them in. And we had them just shout, really, going here, there, and everywhere. And then we added harmonies on top, and it was magic. And you know, and, and Dwight could really sing. And, and in fact, the very last hip to be square is is Dwight. And had I known how well he could sing, I would have actually put him on more of the song. I, I feel bad that we didn't, and and we've lost him. He was one of one of my great friends. I mentioned again, you know, you're not touring anymore, but of course, you have this musical on Broadway. What do you hope this musical will add to the legacy of your catalog? It was amazing to first watch the show and see how our, our musical director, Brian Usefer, has reimagined everything. And to see all those songs in a row like that, and some of them are, are songs that we hadn't performed in years, you know, but to see them all like that and hear them all was fascinating to me because... I began to see a thread, you know, that winds through our stuff. When we're writing songs, we're writing them as individual things. You know, one song has nothing to do with the other. But now that I see them all like that uh, reimagined, I see hmm, there is a kind of a common thread here. And and our writer, John Abrams, has identified that, I think. And, uh, and that sort of bleeds to our cast and our character. It's not about me at all, but there's a lot of parallels. He's the same age I was when I started this band. This was my last shot. It's kind of Bobby's last shot, and um, it made sense to me. And, and it was gratifying to see the songs have this other life. The musical is not about you. There are some parallels, but between your musical Back to the Future musical, the Netflix doc, of course, on We Are the World. There certainly seems to be a renewed interest in you. Your life has been incredible. I mean, from baseball player to hitchhiker to Ivy Leaguer at one point. <laughs> Have you thought about doing a memoir or any type of docuseries? Yes, there, we're doing a documentary, uh, a, a documentary named Kurt Kenny, who's a brilliant filmmaker, actually. He's He's, he's way overqualified for my documentary. But he happens to have a flaw, which is he's a, he's a huge Huey Lewis and the News fan. He grew up in, our, in, in the Bay Area. And so he's been working on it for years. So that's going to happen here in the next couple months, I think. As far as a memoir, you know, I've been encouraged to do it by many people. But I, I feel like I, I have to kind of do it myself at first, at least. And, and it's a lot of work, frankly. And... Uh, so far, I'm just, you know, we're trying to get this show up. That's, that's our focus right now. When you look back at the journey you've had to get to this point, is there one point of that journey that maybe seems more improbable than the others that you were able to overcome or get through? Well, yeah, I mean, the first one for us was a hit record. Because if you look back in the early 80s, there was no internet. There were no jam bands. There was only, no streaming. There was only one avenue to success and that was a hit record because even fm radio which started as anything and everything in the by late 70s and early 80s chr contemporary hit radio was the only format that mattered and we needed a hit record and you know and and in those days that had to be three minutes or even shorter everything had to be truncated that and my voice is not a classic pop voice i got, got this rough thing going and so it was really tough, and so we produced our own record because we wanted to make those commercial choices ourselves because we knew we'd have to live with them. And so that was the, that was the biggest obstacle we faced, is to get a hit single. And uh, when Heart and Soul was the first single off our third album, Sports, started up the charts, we, we all breathed a sigh of relief. Um, is there a formula to a hit song? Not really. No? Uh, ideally... 
it sounds familiar somehow, and yet it's original. And of course, if it's a rock and roll song, you know, it's it's like a haiku. It, you, you know, you can't have too many difficult chords, or it's now it's not rock and roll anymore. The idiom has been explored, you know, for decades now, so it, it becomes harder, you know, to, to write an original pop song. What else do you want people to know about this musical? Well, just that um, it's funny, it's smart, it has a lot of heart, and I think it's very entertaining. Congratulations on the musical, and uh, looking forward to hearing more from you soon. Thanks.